Please stand with me. And just raise your hands one more time. I want you to prepare yourself to receive from God, to receive a word from God. Not just another Sunday. Don't get religious. Don't think of other things. Oh, Father God, we come to you this morning. And we are hungry. We are calling on you. And we open up our hearts, our lives, even as we've laid them before you in worship. We lay them before you again, that your word would reach us and minister to us and change us, direct us, edify us. Just pray your own personal prayer a moment. Open up your heart to God. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher. Come and be our guide. Lead and instruct. Equip, Lord. Take us forward. Pray for every individual, for every congregation, for every gifting, every calling, every family. Father, that we would receive this morning. Open our eyes as Richard prayed. Open our eyes as we look at Scripture. And let us see in the Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I was, I was greatly blessed last week by Pastor Peter's ministry. Um, I thought it was fantastic. So, so, some of you already know, Peter and I worked together for about 11 years in Dublin. We planted many churches together and went through a lot of experiences together. Uh, it was a wonderful time. It was a very difficult time. I, I, I saw him suffer a lot and go through an enormous amount of pain. But in the end, we got victory, right? I think I, there's, I was trying to count. I think there's eight or nine churches in Ireland today because of our ministry. He functioned as the apostle, and I functioned for about 11 years as his prophet. So in everything we did, and it was phenomenal, it was fantastic to, to see how that actually worked and worked effectively. He would get a word or a vision, and I would share that word. But we were able to walk in mutual respect. You know? You know your gift. It can't be isolated. It can't be isolated. And I discovered something in Peter and working with Peter of great power, a key to my own future. I learned a lot in that time. And I want to continue his message. He spoke last week about what? Open doors. That God is presenting before us an open door. That God has for each of you individually and for us collectively an open door. Listen, eyes forward please. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt for one minute that the same God who died on a cross for me. I mean, how much more? I mean... This is a lesser thing, isn't it? Isn't it? So if he did that for me, I mean, my eyes cannot imagine, I cannot perceive what doors he has for me, right? I couldn't even dream it up. That's what scripture says. So, by the way, don't try and think about what's ahead. Because even in your imagination, you couldn't get there. Mind has not perceived those open doors, the vision, the life that God has for me. But... I really sat there last week with a huge burden on my heart and we were back in our old ministry roles of, you know, prophet and apostle because I realized, I spoke to him immediately after the meeting, I felt so burdened for you because I said, Peter, open doors are not the problem. God's a great God. Closing doors is the problem. Scripture talks about so many new beginnings and fresh starts, stepping in, stepping out, etc., etc. But it is dependent. Everybody say dependent. dependent. It is dependent upon you being able to shut the door. It's dependent on you being willing and able to leave the past behind, to let go of former things, the things that pull you back or you can't go through the door. Did you hear that? 
I have no doubt that God opens doors. I have no doubt for your future there are things beyond your imagination. But they are dependent upon you for a moment looking back and identifying the things that are holding you, that restrain you, that God sees. I was thinking about this. A good example of this is marriage. So, here's a person. They want to get married. And, the, you know, the marriage is over there, through the door. So what does Scripture say? A man must leave. Right? Close the door. A man must leave his father and mother. And he must go and cleave. And that is a, a, not just for marriage, but for cleaving to your ministry, for cleaving to your future. There's something that has to be closed. And I find with people as I listen to them and I talk to them, it's the same. Look, it's the same for salvation. Remember, we had a door open to the world. We lived in the world, right? You rem- if you're saved here this morning, one day you closed that door. You did or you wouldn't be saved. You, in your mind, you made a decision. You shut the door in the past. Do you know what that did? It opened the door to salvation. That's what it did. And it's exactly the same principle throughout Scripture for ministry, for your calling, for your gifting. It's the same in our walk with God, right? We've got to put off the old and put on the new. So I I want you to pause a moment this morning. You know, as I pondered on this this week, it seems to me there were three principal ways in which people get stuck in terms of moving forward. Either they are unaware that the door is open or they're unwilling to shut it, right? Or they're unable to shut it. Unaware that there even is something pulling me back, you know? Unwilling or unable. And that, whatever it might be, is the thing that pulls us. Now, give me your full attention, please. You can have a dream, but it may not have come from God. Maybe you enter into a relationship, and the relationship's not from God. Right? Now, it is incredibly difficult. We call them soul ties. It's incredibly difficult to pull yourself out of a relationship, isn't it? It's hard. They get a grip. They put down roots in us. And in your past... When you got saved, you could have had a vision, a dream, but maybe it's not God's will. And that thing gets such a grip, such a deep root, but God says, you know, I want you to close the door on that. And if you will let that go, we can move on. But if you are determined to keep a hold of this thing, there was a bomb in my street when I was a kid, a hotel, six doors down, boom. And that hotel caught fire. The fire engines came and they hosed the place down. And I remember as a little kid, for the next couple of days, because it was a building that had collapsed, the fire brigade were still coming back. And I was amazed. I thought, what are they doing? And they were pumping this water. The bomb was three days ago. An old flame. eh? That's That's what's called an old flame. There's an old flame buried inside that thing. And they can't leave. And it looks as if it's dead. There's no smoke. They go away. And then somebody, it's off again. (laughs) And then they come back and start pouring water. That old flame thing is not just about relationships, but about your ministry, about your future, about God's goals. And I repeat, they can be false goals. I mean, I hear some people prophesying, so-called prophecy, over people. I think, oh, good. You gonna believe that? True? I think I really question I am sorry. I love prophecy. I don't despise it, but I really question if that's God. And vulnerable people can hear something and they walk away with it. And they start to nurture this thing. And I end up in many says, I haven't gone and saying, that wasn't the Lord. That wasn't the Lord. And you have got this this thing has got a grip on your heart. And you need to get it out to move on. Wow. A friend of mine got married yesterday. I'm, I, I tell you, I'm so over the moon about that because I was heavily involved in her not marrying a previous guy. <laughs> now, he's a good guy. Good guy. And she's a good girl. Just not together. <laughs> right? 
just not together. And it was very painful. It was a hard, hard job for me. I said, no, 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 no. And in the end, she thought, yeah, okay, no. Now listen to this. Listen carefully. I persuaded her this is the, it's not the right guy. So in one day, she came to mental agreement with me. Okay, it's not the right guy. In one day, she phoned him and she broke off the relationship. That's two days. But see to get that man out of her heart, six or seven years. Yeah. That's what I want to get at. Just a mental thing is not what does it. There's deep roots and there are things within me that prevent me from moving forward. There's maybe the wrong things that God is trying to close a door and I am determined that this is him and that's why we need the counsel of the brethren, you know. We need to listen to one another. Many people are in revolving doors instead of sequential doors and that's what I believe in. I, I, I Believe me, friends, I have had some experience in this. Not as much experience as I should have had, God forgive me, but I have had experience in getting, shutting off my past and moving forward and seeing the fruit of it and then doing it again and seeing the fruit of it. But I don't find enough people like that. I really don't because the same God will bless all of us. But are you willing, able and aware that you need to shut some doors today? You need to let go of some things that maybe have a grip on you. How do we do this? Point one on your notes this morning. Let me just read that out. You, you can accept your past. No sin, no action, no choice on your part is too big for God to handle or too big to be worked out for good. Isn't that good news? Just ask Joseph or better still ask his brothers who ended up relying on him for their survival. The same God who opens doors will close them and you can look at Acts chapter 16 where the Apostle Paul was, had an idea that he was going to go to Asia, right? And twice the Lord stopped him and shut the door, said, I don't want you to go to Asia. <coughs> he turned him around, and that's why the gospel came to Europe. So be determined to, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit about your past. I think I shared with you before, a, a, a girl in Glasgow one day was paying the tambourine, and I had never in my life experienced... The tambourine can be a bit noisy. You know what I mean? Um, I had never experienced anyone play the tambourine like that. It was anointed. She was gifted. And I just made a little comment. I said, wow, you can play that tambourine. And she laughed and she said, there's a story behind that. I said, what story? And she said, well, I didn't want the tambourine. I want the keyboard. So I, I went to the worship leader and I said, I want to put my name down. She said, I want to be on the team. I want to play a keyboard. And the worship said, I'll come back to you. And I went away, prayed about it, came back, said, no, close door. We want you to play tambourine. And she said, I was so disappointed. I want a keyboard. I don't want the tambourine. She said, but I accepted it. It's a closed door. And I took the tambourine. But when I took the tambourine, wow. And anointing, I said, that's what I can say. You don't know what you miss behind the open door. And the thing that I have a dream about, the vision, if it's a dream, if it's a vision that I can cook up, then it's probably a lot less than God's. Amen? If it's something that I can concoct in my head, or if it's something that I can already see, then it's probably less than what God has in mind. No eye has seen, no mind can imagine. And she entered into the true open door. And I mean, here's a simple question for you. Is it okay if God says no? I didn't, I heard a few yeses there. Is it okay if God says no? Still, Tara, that's worse than camera. Is it okay if God says no? Yes. He's listening, you know. Right. It is okay if God says no, even if I'm totally and utterly convinced. And you, I, I know that each one of you could think back on your life and you can remember some time when you were determined that this was right and it was wrong. Remember? And then you look back on that time and you say to yourself, I am so glad 
now that I didn't do that. I'm so glad now that he shut the door and he made it impossible for me. Well, actually, to be honest, the worst type of Christians in the whole world are the people who God shuts a door, but they find a way around. <laughs> yeah? And, and, and then they make a mess of life, and then life becomes about vindicating yourself. I, 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 I was right, I was right, I was right. No, you weren't, you were wrong. Now, the wonderful thing about God is he can still help you in that situation. And that's, in, in fact, let me read that scripture. Revelation chapter 3, is it? Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he shuts, sorry, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. But I tell you what, people find ways to, to go around and to construct things that they know that God is not with them in. And then life becomes an absolute mess. And then we can spend our lives vindicating ourselves. Oh, I, I, I was right, I was right. But all the time we know we're wrong. Halfway down your notes there, I've given you a scripture from Genesis chapter 50. When the brothers had come back to Joseph and Joseph was reacquainted with, with them, reunited with them. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in place of God? You intended to harm me. So what was their intention? Kill him. But God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done. Eyes forward. The whole nation is going to be saved. There's a famine. They're, going, they're starving to death. That's one massive blessing through that door. That's an open door. But there's a problem. The problem is honesty. Joseph, the brothers, first of all, have to say, we tried to kill you. That's what we did. We tried to kill you. And Joseph, asked, he, he, he says right to them, you tried to kill me. Yes, we did. Honesty. That's what happened in the past. And friends, every one of us have done things made decisions, and, it's, and, and it was not God, in order to move forward, at some point in your life, you need to say, maybe for the last 20 years, you've been saying that was God. And you've been trying to convince everybody that it was God. Are you with me? Yeah. The way we get through the door is one day you stop, and maybe for the first time you say, do you know what? Just like Joseph, it was me. That was my decision. I did it. I was wrong. But guess what? God bless me anyway. <laughs> I did it. I was wrong. I'm sorry I did it. Lord, I repent. And I will not twist the truth. And the wonderful thing about those two scriptures put together there with, with Joseph is no matter what decisions you've made, in point one, God can take your present, he can take your circumstance and still get you through that door. But not without honesty. Not without honesty. Not without honesty. You have to tell the truth about how you got here, how you got this far in life. So you think back. You think back. It's, it's the same for me in, in, in marriages. Forgive me, folks, but I work with a lot of people on marriages. Privately, publicly, I work with a lot of people. And I've set a lot of people free. But many times, I've had to sit with a couple and for the first time, I've had to say to them, you shouldn't have married him. <laughs> yeah, for uh, ouch is right, yeah. It's a big out. It has to be said. At some point, the truth has got to be said. What sets people free? The truth sets people free. And you can only build from that place. And someone is the first person to say that. And it's like a bomb goes off in the room. Now we can start to build. Now you can start to build... You talk to one another, you're still married, and God can bless your marriage, but not with that open door. It's all the time in the back of your mind, an old flame, an old burning thing of bitterness or resentment. I shouldn't have done this. That's what you're thinking. It's just that I'm saying it. You think it, I say it. Why do I do that all the time? Yeah? You're thinking it, and I'm saying it. I'm revealing that old flame. We're going to put it out, and you're going to move on. Right? Not just for marriage, also for ministry and any other area. The country you live in. 
Right? Wherever you are, wherever God is, you can force the issue. You can be determined to have your own way. Well, he can bless you anyway. But you have to tell the truth. <laughs> you have to tell the truth. God, this is me. That's me. I'm doing this. I've done this. And that opens the door that Peter was talking about. That opens the door for your future and for mine. Point one. You can accept your past. We've all made mistakes. We've all made huge mistakes. But God is bigger than that. Secondly, you can embrace the present. There's no need to play the what-if game. The past is forgiven. God is omnipotent. God is unpowerful. And he can take you from where you are, right? I would encourage you to accept delays once God has spoken. Accept delays and accept circumstances no matter what happens. Eyes forward. Accept the present. So God tells you there's an open door. You in your heart close the door in the past. Then, you know my advice? Watch out. <laughs> because if you genuinely close the door in the past, he's going to start to act. He's going to move. You've just got God's attention. Are you listening? If you genuinely close the door in the past, God's going to start to move. I, I, I told you, so don't worry about the present. It will probably lie to you. It will look strange. I told you about Cynthia, my friend. I, I prayed for her. God would give her a husband. Remember, she worked in Dublin with myself and Peter for years. She was a good girl, but couldn't find a husband. I prayed and God said, get, tell her to get ready. You see. So I told her to get ready. Remember? So she did. What happened? She ended up deported. Yeah. Doom, just like that. Out of the country. She was devastated. Pastor Mike said, I'm going to get married now. I'm on a plane back to Singapore. The devil. Not the devil. Not the devil. Not that it was God, because her husband was in Singapore. That's right. That's right. So as, as soon as that was ready, as soon as the, you know, the spirit was right, she was gone. God intervened and put her in the right place. Amen? Amen. So don't, don't worry about what the circumstance looks like. God gives direction, not directions. And too many people are looking for directions. You're waiting for an A, B, C, D. No. He will give direction, general direction. And what, if we start to analyze the present, you're going to become over-analytical, and that's just going to kill you. It's going to stop you. Right? Let, let God deal with that part. Goodness knows, I tell you, I've, I've, I've been through this, but to my own great delight, <laughs> praise God. You know my story. I, I, I was in social services, same as you, Mike, working in mental health, and I loved it. But I had a burden. I had a calling. I had a calling to preach the gospel. It's burning in my heart. I've got a door. It's open. I, excuse me, I'm just going to work. <laughs> yeah. Listen to me, eyes forward. Many of you are doing things you don't want to do. Every day. You're going to a job you don't want to go to. And you've been doing it for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. True? Yeah. yeah. Many of you, your entire lives will be spent doing things when at the back of your mind you actually wish you were doing something else. True. Oh yeah, very quiet, huh? Just say it as it is. Do you know what that, do you know what that is? You're looking at this stuff and behind you is that open door. You know it's there. You know it's true. You've just got to shut this, that's all. So I was in social services. I wrote out my, res my resignation. I loved that job. I went in. My boss was called Iviona Williams. And I gave her my thing. And we went in a little tea room. And they came in to me as if I was on a, you know, mentally ill. <laughs> my resignation. Uh, my, they were, you know, feeling sorry for me. Oh, bless him. <laughs> What's wrong with him? He's a Christian. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> Never mind. It'll clear up soon, you know? That's my resignation. And they started telling me, you, you, what are you going to live on? I don't know. I've got directions, not direction. What are you going to do for money? I don't know. I know one thing. I've got to close the door. I've got to close the door. <laughs> so you keep that. I'm not taking it back. So I had no money. I had nowhere to live. 
But I believed that I needed to get through that door. So I resigned. And a friend called Declan gave me a little room. And I slept in that room. And I told you, I went to my pastor. I had trained in evangelism. I went to my pastor and I said, I'm available for, for evangelism, teaching and preaching. Of no interest to me. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That was great. He said, no, this is not right, you know. This is not right. You feel really foolish. Go back to my little room. You know, minister without portfolio. I sit there, what, what do I do now? I told, and I respected the pastor, he's a good guy. I told him I wanted to teach evangelism. That's not his problem. Street preaching. That's the only thing I was trained in. And then it was three weeks. And the office in his phone, he was a Baptist. Office, uh, the phone in his office rang. Just an odd call from nowhere from the Baptist Union saying, we're just ringing on the off chance that you would have anybody who we need someone quickly to work for the Baptist Union to teach street preaching. He go, um, I've got just the guy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And that was my first commission, actually. I did that for three years. So why did I get God's attention? So as soon as I shut that door, that gets his attention. He knows I'm serious. He sees that I'm willing. He knows I'm aware. And suddenly he's involved. And it's not just me concocting things. I didn't dream that up. I didn't make that phone call. My pastor didn't make that phone call. God, you know. Sent the phone call, right? And that's what I want. I don't want my visions or my... I want my heavenly calling. Heavenly calling. I want God involved in this. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says this. Whoever looks at the wind will never sow. And whoever looks at the rain will never plant. And I promise you, friends, I could have... When that lady was saying to me, you've got no money, that's wind. That's wind. You've got nowhere to live. That's rain. Whoever looks at the rain, you're never going to do anything. You will have 10,000 people who will tell you that you can't. And praise the Lord if you get one who says you can. Trust me. Believe me. Especially if you're going to do something significant. Last week, praise the Lord for Ashish. And the work we've done in social media, um, What's Love Got to Do With It? The book was posted and reposted 211,000 times last week. Outstanding. I mean, I'm shocked. But see, every, I, got that, I got that in a vision form. I didn't speak about sex. I didn't, that's the last thing I would speak about. A bit like yourself, Richard. I would never want to talk about it. Just joking. <laughs> I didn't want to talk about it. I would be embarrassed about it. And we had a big staff team in Glasgow, actually with 13 full-timers. I can remember it. I can see it now. And I got this vision that, oh, I'm going to be, you know, teach about sex and all that. Wow. Whoo. Whoo. <laughs> so I go to the staff meeting and I'm all excited. Hey, guys, I got a vision. For the future, what's going to happen? I'm going to do this thing, and we're going to be ministering in, in, in sex and couples and marriage. And they're all totally blank. <laughs> not you. Yeah. Not you, you know. You're dreaming. Yeah, I am dreaming. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I don't need your faith. I don't need your faith. I didn't get this from you, and I don't need you to complete it. I, didn't, I don't need the round of applause. I don't need your encouragement even, to be honest. I'm not looking at your rain. I'm not looking at your wind. This is what I need. Right? There has to be a determination. And the determination comes with the right word from the right place. Sadly, many people spend their entire lives. Mike, when I left social services, I went for a meal with one of our members, the family. And I'll never forget it because the son asked me a very good question, because I was a good nurse. And he said to me, but you're a Christian. And as a Christian, you're doing a very good job, because we know you're good at your job. How can you as a Christian leave your work as a nurse? Because you're doing a good job. 
And my reply to him was, there are tens of thousands of people who can be a nurse. It's not one of the ones mentioned in scripture. <laughs> God bless nurses. Hallelujah. But who's going to share the gospel? That was a good answer. That answer comes from your spirit, right? That's the right answer to the questions. The right answer. There's nothing wrong with being a doctor. Nothing wrong with any of those things. And many professions. Nothing wrong. But there's a higher calling. Many of you will spend your life hearing the voice, knowing there's an open door, but you're going to say, but. I would have done it. But. I didn't have any money. Neither did I. <laughs> I would have done it. But. I didn't have anywhere to live. But. And you've got to get past that. Other people are going to say one day. <laughs> That's another. Tr it's a trick. It's a trap. One day I'm going to do it. Well, one day never comes, right? It's never going to come. And there has to be a moment. There has to be a time when you stop and you start. And by the way, it's never too late. It's never too late. I was looking at the life of Smith Wigglesworth. You know him? One of the most famous people of modern times. How could someone have such impact, right? Enormous impact in the relatively recent past because there were miracles. I mean, people raised from the dead. There's all sorts of amazing things happened with him. He was a plumber. He wasn't a pastor. He was a rough plumber. He didn't enter ministry till 58. 58 years old. And he died at 87. That's amazing. So age is not a restriction, right? Age is not a restriction. In fact, you're more valuable because you've had lots of experience. Age is not a restriction. These buts and these gunners are always going to be there. And at some point, I have to make a decision that I am not going to let that stop me. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to be one of the people who overcome. And there will be thousands to my left and thousands to my right who are trying to persuade me why I can't. Because they're not doing it, right? That's how it works. They vindicate themselves just by themselves by saying, you can't do it because I'm not doing it. These are all the reasons why not. You can't let that affect you. Point three. If you agree to that, then you can look forward to the future. <clears throat> You can look expectantly forward to everything and anything that God may have for you. With no stress, no manipulation, no control. I love that. Eyes forward. Please remember, closing the door is not just closing the door on things or relationships or desires or visions that were wrong. But it's also closing the door on manipulation and on control. When I was up in Glasgow for two months for the first time, 2003, 2004, God had spoken to me then that you're going, I'm going to come back here and be the pastor here in Glasgow. I, okay. So I told you, I went to Dublin and I met Rick and I said, hey, I think I should go to Glasgow. And I feel, you know, that's what God's saying to me. And he just shut me down boom, like a bullet. No, <laughs> no, instant. Not one thing. No, you're not going. That's, no, it's not right. Stay here. I got a lot of friends in high places and I can pull a lot of strings today and then but that's manipulation and I could do all sorts of things to actually bring <laughs> oh yes and bring those things about but I will never forget leaving that encounter with him because I went outside and I spoke to God and I said because I'm in a structure so are you you have to obey the structure. You hear from God, but you submit the word. You have to do both. All right? Don't be a rebel. And I went outside and I said, God, I will serve this church without rebellion, without manipulation, with I shut the door. And I had to serve for two years. And then he came back reluctantly and said, I'm saying you. He didn't know why he was doing it. I don't know why I'm doing it. Yeah. You can go. Praise the Lord. So God gives you that vision, he gives you that dream, he gives you that word for your future. Don't try and manipulate. But you may need to be pretty drastic. In fact, let me read this one. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 21. 
This is a man who got a calling and he knew what he had to do to enter that calling. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 21. Elisha has followed Elijah. He believes that the door is open for a double portion. He believes that he can have that anointing, that mantle. And he follows him. Verse 21, what does Elisha do? Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of auction and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment. Imagine that in those days. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat. And that's pretty emphatic, isn't it? And he gave it to the people and they ate. That's a guy who's determined to shut the door, right? And make it very heard by God. I am closing the door on my past and I'm opening up to the future. Now, the Apostle Paul deals with people in, I think it's Corinthians, where some of them were just running off to leave their work. And he says, don't do that. So I'm not saying to you to go out of here and resign, right? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying to you is go before God. Go before God and be sensitive and assess where your future lies. Pray about it. Think, is there anything back there, an old grievance, an old hurt, an old unforgiveness, an old flame, something that's preventing me from moving forward that I need to let go of so that God can actually let go of the silver so he can give me the gold. I thank God for Peter. He's been probably the main figure in my life for many years. But I tell you, he practices what he preaches. And it's a long story, but it's not private. But 15 years ago, he was full-time staff with Assemblies of God and with VFC, just like me. He's the same position as me. We did the same role. But his life got in a little bit of turmoil, and he was still employed, but he stepped down for a while, still employed by both agencies. And he was in limbo. <laughs> Not forward, not back. He was stuck. Like some of you. <laughs> stuck. Revolving door. And I got a phone call. He said, I'm coming to see you. I said, okay, no problem. He flew a long way. I was living in Liverpool. And we went out for a meal. And he said, you always told me the truth. <laughs> you always told me the truth. About life and what I should do. Take your best shot. What should I do? I said, you know what you should do? Resign from VFC. And resign from ARG. And then what? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> had no idea. Just resign. Let's see what happens. And he flew away. And then a few weeks later, I get a phone. Hey, do you hear what? Peter's done. He's resigned from ARG and VFC. Okay. He shut the door. And he made himself available for a brand new day and a brand new start. I was very impressed by that because he had no income and nothing. And I, I was struggling all week last week not to cry because to see him so free. Oh, Jesus. I could scream hallelujah. To see him so free. Someone who was so broken and so bruised and so ruined and so destroyed and so set aside, so parked. To see him so free and so anointed and so with God just blesses the socks off me. Hallelujah. And I look back on that date. I'm glad I told you to burn your yoke and to slaughter your oxen and to cut off all the supply of men. Because now you're free. He wants to do something in the UK that we get together as leaders and churches, etc. For he called, they call it the gathering around the world. There are actually huge meetings taking place around the world where we just bring God, invite God. There's no big shot, no speaker. There isn't any sermon. They just gather to be with God. So I'm not telling you to do anything he hasn't done. And I'm not telling you to do anything I haven't done. I haven't got the right to do that. I have butts that come after me the same as you but I've overcome some of them I need to overcome more I have the feeling that procrastination I'll put it off I'll do it tomorrow do you know what to do with procrastination procrastinate it yeah 
When you find yourself saying, I'll do it tomorrow. No, put that off. Say that on Friday. But do what you've got to do today. Seize the moment. Seize today, this morning. Okay? God only knows. You don't know. God only knows what he has in store for those who will be bold enough, crazy enough, stupid enough, Nana. Nana was praying here on Tuesday night, Wednesday night. God, pray that we will be stupid enough, foolish enough, as scripture puts it, to get through that door. Anybody up for that? I'm going to hand over to Pastor Simeon. And he's going to take us through communion. And I encourage you to put the past under the blood of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I just want to read a scripture to you as we get ready for communion. But I need you to stay with what I believe the Lord is speaking to us about today. Don't lose it. Stay with it. Stay with it. But in the book of Luke chapter 22 verse 19 says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Pay attention to verse 20. It says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. I'm reading from the NKJV. The new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you the new covenant he said new particularly because there was an old one are you following what i'm saying an old one so in the spirit of what we hear today bear in mind jesus says a new covenant is represented in this close the door to the past and today as we get ready for oh, hang on a minute yes thank you as we get ready for communion Say to yourself, I stand in the presence of the Lord today, marking this day as the day where I shut the door, I close the door to discouragement, I close the door to anything you know. Like Pastor said, that is wrong, that you need to let go of so you can look forward to a brand new future. Let this moment of communion begin that process for you. I encourage you. Go before the Lord today. Use this opportunity, this moment to say, I want to end this, this bitterness of my past so I can embrace a new future of trust in people again, a new future of honesty with myself, a new future of a new move in the direction God is giving me. Are, are we together today? Amen? So we, we're going to play a song, but also meditate on the song very carefully. And at the end of the sharing, we'll all stand and sing that song one more time reflectively and begin to go before the Lord in communion. Say, God, I use these emblems, these symbols of the new covenant to shut the door today. Maybe you've been living in a certain way that you know it's not right. And the Lord is calling you forth into a new life, a new character, a new way of thinking. You want to use this moment and say, I shut the door. It could be some struggles. It could be some issues with ministry. You want to use this moment and say, I shut the door. And I want to move into a new direction that the Lord is calling me forth to. Amen. So I need you to be thinking. I'm sure by now with all the examples that have been given, you are at a place where you can tell, you can sense which direction God is calling you into. With all this, you can tell what the Lord is actually saying to you right now. So let's go ahead and share this communion today. And, thank you. And as it comes around, pray to God, speak to the Lord, wait for everybody to have one, and then we'll all take it together.
Yes, Angela, please. 